Welcome everyone. Um, as the room is filling, both virtually and here in O'Keefe Auditorium at Mass General Hospital, just wanna welcome you to our webinar today, sponsored by the Regional Disaster Health Response System in Region 1 and the Region 1 Emerging Special Pathogens Treatment Center here at MGH. Um, I wanna start just with a disclosure and summary of relevant financial relationships, which you can see here, there are no relevant financial relationships. Um, today, the SMS code for attendance is listed here. You'll also see it pop up in the chat. So if you can't memorize that very quickly, you will see that in the chat. So no worries there. Today, we're going to be talking about highly pathogenic avian influenza, and we'll be providing a comprehensive overview. I'm delighted to be able to welcome two terrific speakers here who are going to give you a fast-paced tour of some of the most uh, salient um, aspects, both in the epidemiology as well as clinical overview. Um, just some housekeeping. We're going to be having the slides and the recording available after this uh, meeting, and that'll be posted on the RDHRS website. Please um, note that we're to limit background noise, the microphones have been muted. Please put your questions and comments um, in the Q&A box. We're gonna be monitoring that. And then at the end, we'll be posing those questions to our two speakers. And you can obviously join the conversation on social media, media by following, and we're not sure what the word is now, tweeting, xing, posting um, at Region 1 RDHRS. I do wanna acknowledge the sponsors, as I've mentioned before. Both programs are funded by the um, Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, or ASPR, within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and this is the disclosure um, that we're providing to you. So um, just to introduce myself, I should have said in the beginning, Erica Chinoy. Um, I'm the Chief of Infection Control here at Mass General Brigham Health System, um, and I'm the Medical Director of our uh, Special Pathogens Program. Um, David Bannock, um, is here with us from the University of Connecticut. He is an associate professor of medicine and the hospital epidemiologist and head of infection prevention for UConn Health. Um, he's been um, doing this for 17 years, um, extensive experience in infectious diseases, and has authored numerous articles for journals such as the American Journal of Infection Control, Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology, and Anaerobe, the official journal of the Anaerobe Society of the Americas. We're pleased to have him. Um, we also are pleased to have Dr. Tim Uecki, who is the Chief Medical Officer in the Influenza Division at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where he's been working on the clinical, clinical aspects, epidemiology, prevention and control of influenza in the U.S. and worldwide since 1998. Um, his interests include zoonotic influenza, clinical management of patients with influenza, and emerging viral infectious diseases. He's a clinical professor at UCSF. Um, these are the learning objectives that you received in the invite, so I won't reiterate them here, but we'll get through all of them. And then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Uecki. So I will oops, stop sharing my screen, and he can share his screen. Thanks, Perfect. Dr. Shinoy. Um, are you able to see my full slides? Perfect. Okay, great. So thanks for the um, invitation uh, to speak, the opportunity to speak about human infections with highly pathogenic avian influenza H5N1 virus, the epidemiology and clinical aspects. I'll um, just abbreviate the virus by not um, talking about highly pathogenic, but just say H5N1. So I'll try to give some background on H5N1 viruses, talk about wild bird infections, poultry outbreaks spill over to mammals, the epidemiology of human infections with H5N1 viruses since 1997, risk factors for infection, some of the clinical characteristics, clinical management issues, uh, testing and antiviral treatment, and infection prevention and control recommendations. So the first time we heard about this virus was actually in 1959 during a poultry outbreak in Scotland. But what's um, really um, been um, in the forefront is uh, ever since this virus was re-identified in a goose in Guangdong province, southern China in 1996. And this is important because all viruses since then um, are essentially um, uh, have evolved from that um, virus back in Guangdong province in 96. So these viruses continue to evolve both antigenically and genetically They can undergo a genetic reassortment. This is characteristic of all avian influenza A viruses. 
And they've evolved into distinct antigenic groups that we refer to as clades and subclades. And what we saw is these viruses really evolved and started spreading out of Asia and wild birds, migratory birds and poultry. And then um, certainly in about the, the mid 2000s, we saw this spread to more than 60 countries. Um, and this includes different regions of the world in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. And in some of these countries, there was endemic circulation that was established in poultry. Um, in recent years, we've seen wider spread to different regions of the world, different countries by wild birds. And since 2020, this specific antigenic group that's referred to as clade 2.3.4.4B H5N1 viruses, these have spread to all over the world. Uh, in particular, uh, at the very end of 2021 and into 2022, the spread among wild birds into North America was documented um, with resultant poultry outbreaks. We've had many, many different kinds of wild bird species that have been detected, not just in North America, but all over the world. These include both scavenging birds, predatory birds, shore birds, et cetera. And in the US, um, this virus has been detected in wild birds in every state except for one, um, as well as some of our territories. In, at the end of last year, we saw the spread in migratory wild birds into South America. This is the very, very first time that any highly pathogenic avian influenza A viruses were detected in South America. Um, and then, as a result, there have been more wild bird detections and some poultry outbreaks. Now, just to make the point, although that many, many wild birds, when they're infected, they actually die and they die rapidly. Not all birds are, are equally susceptible and there are some duck species that can have asymptomatic infection. So they can um, be infected and they can inf transmit to other birds and poultry. In the US, um, starting from early 2022, we have had um, detections in either commercial poultry flocks or backyard flocks. Some of those backyard flocks are poultry and some of them uh, include exotic bird species. Um, in almost every state, 47 states, almost 60 million um, birds have been affected, either died or been culled. And actually um, most of this occurred last year and early this year and over our summer months in 2023, we actually didn't have outbreaks of H5N1 detected in, in birds, in commercial birds or backyard flocks. But in, in the last 30 days or so, there have been uh, more detections. And um, this is likely related to migratory birds that are coming south from Northern Canada. And so we actually could see an increase in poultry outbreaks and wild bird detections in the weeks to months to come. Now let's talk about um, H5N1 virus infections of mammals. This, although this has been the headlines a lot, particularly this calendar year, this is actually not a new uh, development. We've known that mammals can be infected with H5N1 viruses since late 2003. This was documented in tigers and leopards in a zoo in Thailand. There are also dogs and cats that were infected. Um, these animals most likely were infected because they were fed or they consumed uh, poultry that had been um, uh, infected with H5N1 viruses. Either poultry were culled um, to depopulated or they died and they were fed to these um, other animal species. And since then, and particularly since last year, there's been a huge amount of different mammals, terrestrial mammals that have been reported in many countries, not just the US and not just in Europe. Um, most likely these, these are, are uh, either wild or domesticated terrestrial mammals that consumed infected birds. Could be wild birds, could be poultry. Huge number of, of species. Um, this ranges from against uh, small uh, scavenger animals to large predatory animals. You can see the list there. And also there have been outbreaks in farmed animals that are um, raised for fur. This includes mink, big outbreak in Spain about a year ago, Arctic foxes in Finland earlier this year and some other species. This is also not a new development. We have known that avian influenza viruses can infect farmed mink. 
Um, and this has also been documented in previous years for H5N1 viruses, so not a new development. Uh, actually, those kinds of settings, you can actually control it by culling all the infected animals. Most likely, these animals, um, farmed animals, have been infected by consuming um, infected poultry, or there's been contamination where wild birds, um, actually transmission from wild birds to these mammals occurred. And because they're in very densely uh, dense uh, cages, it's very easy to have mammal to mammal transmission in those settings. But there's also been um, a lot of marine mammals, seals, sea lions, porpoises, dolphins. This has been documented off the Atlantic coast of the US as well as um, in South America more recently. Um, some huge die-offs. Recently, we've also had some detections in seals in the Pacific Northwest. Now it's pretty unclear if there's actually established transmission that's sustained among mammals. Most of the thought is that this represents environment to mammal transmission um, because shorebirds, seabirds are infected. The viruses are excreted in the feces. These are uh, marine mammals that are sharing the same environment. And there can be some transmission um, transiently, but it's the general thought is that this is um, environment to, to sea mammal uh, transmission. Um, I just want to make one point that seasonal influenza A viruses and avian influenza H5N1 viruses have different receptor binding tropism for the respiratory tract. This is not completely clear cut, but for the most part, seasonal influenza A and B viruses bind predominantly to alpha 2 6 sial sialic acid linked receptors um, that are present mostly in the human upper respiratory tract whereas avian influenza A viruses bind predominantly to alpha-2-3 sialic acid receptors that are present in the respiratory and gastrointestinal tract of birds. And these alpha-2-3 sialic acid receptors can be found in the human lower airway. There are some alpha-2-3 receptors in the human upper airway, but it's predominantly alpha-2-6. So in order for people to be infected, most of the time, these H5N1 viruses need to get into the lower respiratory tract of people. And the other point in the lower part of this figure is to show that, as I mentioned, the virus is, infects the respiratory and the GI tract of birds, and so the, the, the viruses are excreted in the feces. And when they're excreted in the feces, they're in the local environment where these birds are, and they're also all over the bird and the feathers, and there can be multi-organ infection in these birds as well. So let's look at the epidemiology of human cases of H5N1 virus. The first time we heard about um, poultry to human infection, was in the Hong Kong outbreak in 1997 with 18 cases and six human deaths. There were some additional cases that were serologically confirmed. Um, this was the first time we knew that the virus could transmit directly from um, a chicken to a person and actually kill them. Um, this was associated with um, people visiting live poultry markets in Hong Kong. Hong Kong cleaned up the markets. They implemented other control measures and they stopped that outbreak. Then um, we next had uh, a few years in which uh, we didn't hear anything about H5N1 virus infections of people until uh, early 2003, uh, when a family from Hong Kong traveled to Southern China, Fujian province, um, there was a child that died of pneumonia, was not tested. The family returned to Hong Kong and the father and the son were confirmed to be infected. The father died of uh, respiratory failure, ARDS. The son survived. So there's two confirmed H5N1 cases, one, one death and a probable case in the daughter who had died um, without testing in Southern China. So that was pretty alarming. And uh, those of you who are working in public health or clinical medicine back in the spring of 2003 may, re may recall that there were concerns about an H5N1 pandemic initially, uh, but in fact, what was happening was atypical pneumonia caused by SARS-CoV or referred to as SARS-CoV-1. That was the SARS epidemic. Um, and we didn't have sustained transmission. We had mainly nosocomial transmission 
uh, in a number of countries around the world. Um, but that is why initially H5N1 was suspected. And as these viruses spread in migratory birds and poultry to different countries, we had associated human cases in different regions. So to date, since 1997, to my count, there have been 900 cases with about 50 to 53% case fatality proportion, cases reported from 22 countries. Most of these cases had severe pneumonia, young adults, some children, but there's been relatively few cases since 2015, 2016. And most of these cases represent sporadic avian to human H5N1 virus transmission uh, from poultry exposures. There have been some clusters of epidemiologically linked cluster, uh, cases. Most of these clusters represent common poultry exposures in family members. However, there have been a small number of clusters in which probable limited non-sustained human to human transmission likely occurred among blood-related family members. This is an epidemic curve of all the human cases that have been reported since 1997. And what you see is different colors representing different countries that have reported cases. And since 2015, you can see this dramatic drop off in cases. What this epidemic curve illustrates is this sort of this periodicity, this peak of cases, typically in the cooler winter, low, uh, lower temperature and cooler, um, I would say low humidity months, that's when the viruses spread better in poultry and then they transmit to people sporadically. But there are some exceptions and some of these viruses are circulating fine and during uh, higher humidity, warmer temperature months as well. But you can appreciate there's been a huge drop off in cases really since 2015, 2016. Now, what are the risk factors for human infection with H5N1 virus? Um, it's direct or close unprotected exposure to sick or dead infected poultry, raising backyard poultry, visiting a live poultry market where infected birds are uh, sold and, and slaughtered. So it's probably um, inhalation of aerosolized virus uh, in um, uh, different material. Um, it's exposure to infected wild birds, although there have been millions and millions of wild birds infected all over the world. There's only been a small number of human cases, and I can only recall that there are two clusters of cases in which it was wild bird. In this case, it was wild swans that were dead, that were found by uh, some people, mostly in one family. There were seven cases. These were people that were removing the feathers off of these wild swans. Presumably there was aerosolization of virus. And there were seven cases and I believe four of them died. This was in two different clusters in Azerbaijan. So there is the potential for wild bird to human transmission, including resulting in death, but um, uh, very, very um, uh, few cases from wild bird to human transmission. There have been a small number of cases with an unknown source of infection. This includes a one return traveler uh, from Canada who had spent four weeks in Beijing, China, denied any poultry exposure, visiting poultry markets, returned to uh, Canada in late 2013 and actually um, presented with acute respiratory illness, was sent home and then later represented and was admitted to hospital with pneumonia. and. Uh, meningoencephalitis and was a fatal case. So it's the only fatal case of H5N1 uh, in North America. Um, there have been a small number of clusters, as I mentioned, in which it was probably uh, limited non-sustained human to human transmission. This has occurred among blood related family members for the most part. With, but what do I mean by that? A father and a child or two siblings. And this has generally occurred through prolonged, unprotected close exposure. So a family member taking care of another sick family member before hospitalization, but it has also occurred in a hospital uh, from a family member taking care of another family member without any personal protective equipment. So this highlights not only the importance of protecting the healthcare personnel, but also protecting the family members or restricting visitors. Um, to my um, count, there have been no cases of human to human H5N1 transmission reported since 20, 2007. And there have been no cases ever of mammal to human transmission reported. However, I think it's theoretically possible. 
Clinical spectrum of H5N1 virus infection is very wide, ranges from asymptomatic to fulminant critical illness. I would note that most case finding is focused on looking for severe disease, looking for hospitalized patients with severe pneumonia. However, when you do surveillance, uh, follow-up of contacts of cases, or you do routine surveillance for influenza-like illness, there have been a small number of cases with mild illness um, confirmed infection that have been uh, confirmed, including um, in children with just upper respiratory tract illness. Very few cases of asymptomatic infection that have been confirmed both virologically and serologically. Um, more recently, we've had a, a, a fair number of asymptomatic uh, detections reported. My opinion is most, if not all of these reported cases of asymptomatic infection actually do not represent true infection, rather they represent most likely transient detection of viral particles that are de deposited in the upper respiratory tract, or you could just say environmental contamination. The, cl the clinical presentation uh, following poultry exposure is a mean of about three days with a range of two to seven days for the incubation period till symptom onset. Um, those who do uh, progress to severe disease generally present uh, with a median time um, for about six days of hospitalization. So the progression is sort of upper respiratory tract, uncomplicated influenza-like illness with some gastrointestinal tract signs and symptoms, and then progression on about days four to six to lower respiratory tract disease, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, chest pain, tachypnea, and in hospital admission, most cases have findings of hypoxia, signs of pneumonia, um, the classic triad, which some patients have, not at all, not all, which is leukopenia and lymphopenia and mild to moderate thrombocytopenia, radiographic findings of pneumonia. These are some radiographs of confirmed H5N1 cases. Most are fatal. Um, on the right are x-rays I took. Um, the first, the top is a fatal case. The bottom is um, a survived, surviving case who was never intubated, just to say that there are some success stories. Um, complications, pneumonia is the most common complication, progression to respiratory failure, ARDS. Community acquired bacterial co-infection is quite rare as opposed to seasonal influenza. Of course, in ventilated patients, they can develop ventilator associated pneumonia. There are other severe complications, including kidney injury, multi-organ failure, and some atypical complications. Um, the pathogenesis is typically that the virus infects the lower respiratory tract. It reaches high uh, replicating levels of virus, triggering an abnormal or, or dysregulated host inflammatory response. And this inflammatory response results in acute lung injury. Um, it, it, it is possible that the virus may disseminate through viremia and that uh, occasionally what you see is that the virus has been isolated from not only the respiratory tract, but also in um, um, blood serum plasma and also the GI tract and cerebral spinal fluid. So infection prevention control recommendations, we do recommend um, placing a patient in an airborne infection isolation room, isolating the patient. If this is not available in a single patient room, put a face mask on the patient, keep the door closed and arrange transfer to a, a facility with an airborne infection isolation room that has negative pressure and HEPA filtration. Of course, standard contact and airborne precautions are recommended, single use gown, gloves and eye protection with goggles and fit tested N95 respirator or higher level of respiratory protection. So I just wanna um, go through this quickly for testing Commercially available influenza diagnostic tests cannot specifically identify H5N1 virus. If you get a positive test result for influenza A, you can't distinguish between seasonal influenza A virus infection or other novel influenza A viruses, including swine influenza A viruses. So if the patient has mild disease, you wanna collect multiple upper respiratory tract specimens. That should be tested by RT-PCR for influenza A and B viruses at public health laboratories. Subtyping should be done for any influenza A positives. If 
influenza A is positive and H1 and H3 are negative, then H5 should be tested uh, at public health laboratories. Similarly, patients that have pneumonia who are hospitalized, you should also collect the same upper respiratory tract specimens, but collect sputum if they're not intubated. If they are intubated, collect an endotracheal aspirate specimen and collect multiple specimens from different respiratory sites on different days to increase the yield. And I'll just say that there was a case earlier this year in Chile in which uh, an NP swab was negative and the diagnosis of H5N1 was done by RT-PCR testing of a BAL fluid specimen. Clinical management, we do recommend oseltamivir treatment for both mild and severe disease. There's no evidence of oseltamivir resistance in viruses that are circulating in birds. For mild disease, we would say same treatment as for oseltamivir as in seasonal influenza, twice daily for five days. We have no clinical trial data for H5N1. This is based on seasonal influenza. For patients with lower respiratory tract disease, we do also recommend oseltamivir treatment empirically as soon as possible for suspected H5N1, even before you have the test results available. For severe disease, we would say consider extended duration beyond five days. Um, if the patient is intubated, you can give um, oseltamivir enterically through an oral gastric or, or um, nasogastric tube. I'll just say there are case reports of oseltamivir resistance uh, during treatment. We do not have any data on combination antiviral treatment. And all our recommendations are based on limited observational data for H5N1 patients worldwide. Clinical management is predominantly supportive, care of complications. The only thing I'll mention is avoid moderate to high dose corticosteroids because it's associated with prolonged viral shedding and might increase the risk for ventilator associated pneumonia and death. We have no data on combination antiviral treatment of H5N1. We only have animal data. So just to say in the US, we've had more than 6,500 persons monitored after different exposures, more than 165 persons reported with symptoms and who have been tested. We've only had detection of in one person. And that person was someone who reported fatigue that was in Colorado of last year. I don't believe that person was, had truly had true infection. And we've had 17 cases worldwide from eight countries reported since early 2022. Eight of those cases, I don't believe highlighted in red, actually had true infection. That's seven asymptomatic plus the Colorado case with fatigue. However, there have been severe and fatal cases in several countries both in Asia as in South America, including this year. So this virus still can transmit to people and cause critical illness and death. And so the public health assessment is that these viruses are circulating worldwide in wild birds. There's poultry outbreaks, there's sporadic spillover to mammals and rare sporadic human infections. These viruses are very well adapted to, to spread and infect among wild birds and poultry. We're not surprised that there's spillover to mammals. There's no evidence of sustained transmission of mammals. There's no evidence of mammal to human transmission. Almost all of these sporadic cases have had exposure to poultry. No human to human transmission since 2007. We don't think these viruses pose a, a, a very high risk to public health because they don't have the ability to infect our upper respiratory tract if they did we think that would really change the public health risk. So we think the overall risk is low, but because these viruses continue to evolve, we do think that vigilance and ongoing monitoring is needed. And we do expect sporadic human infections with these viruses to occur in people with unprotected exposure, particularly in low resource settings in, in rural areas. And I'll just stop there, thanks so much. That was terrific, um, Dr. Yuecki. As you stop screen sharing, Dr. Bannock is going to start sharing his screens. I thought that was an amazing money slide with the summary there, the last uh, two slides. We're going to answer questions at the very end, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Bannock. Thank you. Just go into presenter mode. Yep. All right. Thank you, uh, 
Dr. Shinoy um, for the invitation and thank you, uh, Dr. Yaki, for um, that great overview. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, kind of walk through an, a hypothetical case. This is a case um, that was based on sort of compiling some of the previously published cases and talk about how um, one might evaluate a patient uh, with suspected um, avian influenza. And so here's our case. Uh, we have a 34-year-old male uh, with no significant past medical history um, who is coming to the emergency department with four days of fevers, chills, and muscle aches. Uh, symptoms began relatively abruptly and have worsened over the last three days. Um, he's been taking acetaminophen, um, but uh, despite acetaminophen, the fevers keep returning. And these fevers are also associated with um, some myalgias of the extremities. I um, mean, he's also been trying to stay hydrated, uh, manage his symptoms. Um, but unfortunately, with the progression of symptoms, he's developed a cough um, and some shortness of breath. So he's evaluated in the emergency department um, at triage. He has a fever um, and a relatively ha fast heart rate um, and his initial um, oxygen levels um, on uh, room air is 92% uh, oxygen saturation. Um, and in our emergency department, like most CDs, patients coming in with respiratory uh, symptoms um, and fever are presented with a uh, procedure mask. So he puts a, a mask on when he's in the waiting area of the emergency department. Um, and then eventually is brought to a private room in the emergency department for further evaluation. And like um, many centers, we utilize a travel screen for patients who are febrile and presenting to the emergency department, uh, which basically um, assesses whether or not there's any uh, travel-related uh, risk for infectious diseases that can cause um, febrile uh, illness. Um, so this patient's administered a travel screen and has no um, specific international uh, travel of note um, to put him at increased risk for um, a travel-related infection. So the initial evaluation, so um, when he's first evaluated in the emergency department, um, we're assessing for um, symptoms, um, getting some information about medical history and epidemiologic exposures. So um, in terms of symptoms, um, we're looking for any associated symptoms with the fever. Um, so uh, any sort of ear, nose, throat related symptoms, gastrointestinal or skin manifestations. Uh, medical history for patients with coming in with fever, we're assessing for comorbidities, particularly immunosuppression. Um, what other medications are patients taking and have they had any recent um, illnesses, procedures, or surgeries? And then epidemiologic exposures are critical for our patients coming in with fever. So uh, I mentioned travel history, but also looking for other um, exposures to infectious diseases at home or in the workplace. Um, and then um, thinking more broadly about um, animal or vector-borne diseases, you know, here in the Northeast, uh, we have a lot of concern about um, tick-related illnesses. So, um, you know, all these kinds of um, uh, components are uh, critical in the initial evaluation of patients coming in with acute febrile illnesses in the emergency department. So coming back to this case, so in this patient, uh, this patient does have some associated symptoms. Um, so he reports that he's having fatigue, diarrhea, some nausea, headache, and arthralgias. Um, he's denying any sore throat, abdominal pain, rash, or urinary symptoms. No significant past medical history. He resides in central New York with his wife and uh, young daughter, both of whom are feeling well. Um, no travel outside of the northeastern U.S., and he works as an accountant, but does enjoy hiking um, with family in New England and was actually um, traveling in the New England area uh, when he came to our center. Uh, we did assess for some um, animal exposure. Uh, so he lives with a domesticated dog, a golden retriever, um, but he also reports that he's been providing care and feeding for his neighbor's pet bird um, for the past five days. Um, so uh, we don't know much detail about this bird. Uh, we do know that the bird was um, acquired from a, um, a market in Brooklyn um, about a week ago. Um, but he, the patient did note that the bird has been um, uh, acting somewhat lethargic. Um, and actually uh, yesterday um, was found to be ill and um, uh, unarousable um, in the cage. So um, fortunately, uh, the neighbor's out of town and we don't know all the details, but we do know that um, this patient has been providing care to a bird that has subsequently become ill. So, you know, when we approach patients um, in these kinds of situations, we always start with a relatively broad differential diagnosis, and we're thinking um, primarily about infections. Um, so a wide slew of different um, organisms that could be implicated in acute febrile illness, so viral infections. I um, mean, you know, certainly, um, you know, COVID-19 over the last uh, four years now um, is uh, a leading uh leading diagnosis in uh, our patients coming with acute fevers, but also think about other respiratory infections, influenza, um, RSV, um, some other um, other uh, viruses like Epstein-Barr and cytomegalovirus, uh, bacterial infections, so um, you know, bacterial pneumonia, 
um, with common organisms, uh, include, and as well as Legionella um, would come into the picture. Um, this patient could also have a primary bloodstream infection or a gastrointestinal explanation for uh, their fevers. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, Vector-borne diseases, as I mentioned here in Connecticut, we think a lot about tick-borne infections um, like anaplasmosis or babesiosis, um, and then uh, zoonotic infections as well. It does report that he's had a dog, so things like pasturella and capnocytophagia um, within the appropriate clinical context would, um, would come up on the differential. And then lastly, I always want to uh, remember with uh, acute fever, we're thinking about other non-infectious um, etiologies, including connective tissue diseases, um, malignancies, as well as um, drugs and medications that can cause um, febrile illness. So um, for the purpose of this uh, presentation, we're going to think a little bit more detail about um, avian influenza. Um, so, uh, you know, when we think about um, patients coming in with possible avian flu, uh, we're thinking both about their clinical presentation as well as uh, the epidemiologic criteria. And I'll kind of review some of that um, here. So this is the CDC criteria um, on uh, epidemiologic uh, exposure. So um, the criteria that's used is recent. Um, so in the last 10 days, exposure to infected birds. Um, and that really is a close proximity exposure to birds who have been confirmed to be um, infected with one of the um, avian influenza viruses. Um, but there's a lot of different um, activities that can be associated with this close exposure listed here, including handling um, and slaughtering birds. Um, you know, a, a exposure could also be consisting of a direct contact with contaminated surface um, that's uh, that's been contaminated by an infected bird. Um, and then uh, the third component is visiting a poultry market uh, with confirmed avian influenza among poultry um, or associated with another or having having close contact uh, with another uh, human who's had uh, confirmed avian flu uh, influenza. Um, and then uh, in terms of exposure to an infected person, so close proximity exposure without the use of PPE to someone who's had um, avian influenza, either in a healthcare facility or in the household. Um, and then laboratory exposure um, can also meet the epidemi epidemiologic criteria. Um, that would be unprotected exposure to a virus in a laboratory. So the clinical criteria, um, so we're really looking for signs and symptoms of acute lower respiratory tract infection, upper or lower, excuse me. Um, and uh, this can be uh, a wide range of different presentations from mild flu-like illness to moderate or more severe illness um, from uh, pneumonia that can result in difficulty breathing. Um, and then uh, in later stages, we see complications of respiratory illness, um, including respiratory failure, um, ARDS, and uh, in most severe cases, multi-organ uh, failure as well. So this is, um, this is data that's uh, collected and reported through the USDA. Uh, Dr. Yecki kind of uh, referred to this. Um, and uh, avian uh, cases of influenza are tracked very closely among poultry and wild birds. Um, and this data um, is provided both in the broad epidemiology uh, context, as well as uh, more detailed descriptions of um, localized um, detections, including clusters. Um, so this is just a snapshot of uh, recent cases um, as of this month, um, and, uh, including a couple of cases um, here in the U.S. Uh, among uh, poultry, as well as um, a few cases over the summertime that were detected in live bird markets, including cases in Kings County, New York. And you recall that in this case, um, this patient had um, reported that the bird was acquired in Kings County um, in New York. Um, so uh, what do we do when we see these patients? You know, we're thinking both about clinical management as well as infection prevention and control measures. Uh, so this is a link uh, to the CDC website that provides the guidance for infection control and prevention um, for uh, taking care of patients with uh, suspected or confirmed in, um, novel influenza A viruses, including avian influenza. Um, you know, the, the data, the background on the data is, um, you know, essentially uh, providing guidance based on a relatively um, limited uh, limited knowledge of these viruses, um, but uh, focusing in on a few factors. So we know that um, you know, these viruses, um, unfortunately, don't have, there's no effective vaccine. So we're limited in terms of our um, uh, pharmaceutical um, interventions, including uh, vaccination. Uh, we know the uh, in human infections from uh, avian influenza can result in high morbidity and mortality. And um, this is a relatively rare um, infection. Um, you know, particularly uh, here in the U.S., as Dr. Yecki mentioned, uh, we've had very few uh, cases of human infections. Um, and the recommendations that the CDC does acknowledge that the recommendations are slightly different um, from uh, seasonal influenza. Um, and 
important to acknowledge some of these differences um, in with the in the back of our mind, recognizing that there's these unique characteristics of avian influenza that I mentioned um, earlier. So what are the recommendations? So Dr. Yaki um, mentioned this, uh, you know, we take care of these patients in an airborne infection isolation room. Uh, we minimize staff entering that room um, and uh, we use the uh, recommended PPE, which consists of gowns, gloves, a respirator and eye protection. So um, going back to our case, uh, so this patient is um, examined in the emergency department uh, using the appropriate infection prevention measures. Um, in terms of uh, the overall presentation, um, he's uncomfortable and diaphoretic. Um, and some of the key findings, uh, we have uh, the patient uh, is tachypnic, um, tachycardic, um, and doesn't have any um, rash or any um, neurological manifestations um, at this point. So the next step um, in the evaluation, we're going to order some laboratory studies. Uh, so uh, what's notable in this case, and this is um, uh, sort of a, a, a typical uh, case, recognizing that there's going to be some variation in patients um, who have this infection. Um, so we have a white blood cell count that's on the low side uh, with 19% lymphocytes. Um, the uh, other abnormalities to notice. Uh, so the creatinine is um, you know, slightly on the higher side um, and AST, ALT, um, so liver enzymes are slightly elevated as well. And on the initial x-ray here, we see bilateral multifocal consolidations um, that would, uh, again, uh, sort of raise some suspicion that we're dealing with an influenza infection. So what are some of the classic uh, laboratory and, um, and uh, imaging findings um, that we would see in H5N1 influenza? Uh, so leukopenia, uh, particularly lymphopenia, two um, important findings. We may see other findings, um, including thrombocytopenia and abnormal liver enzymes. And then on the imaging, um, the classic finding, although there can be uh, there can be a variety of um, radiographic manifestations, um, but the classic we would see would be the bilateral pi perihilar um, consolidations that can be low bar interstitial in appearance, and then in more severe cases, progression to um, pleural fusions and ARDS. So um, thinking about influenza, uh, we start with our uh, laboratory testing. Um, so um, at our center and many centers um, throughout the United States, uh, we do multiplex PCR testing for common respiratory viruses. Um, we have a test called the EXPERT by, um, by Cepheid, um, and that basically consists of a nasal swab. Um, and here we have, um, in this case, um, a, a swab that returns positive for um, influenza A. So um, what are uh, when it comes to laboratory testing, uh, what are some of the sources that we're thinking about? And Dr. Yecki kind of touched upon this. Um, we are thinking about both upper um, respiratory tract specimens as well as lower respiratory tract specimens um, in the setting of suspected pneumonia. Um, and uh, important to recognize that a lot of our commercial assays um, really don't distinguish between uh, subtypes of influenza A. Um, in some of the uh, multiplex uh, molecular tests, we can identify um, novel H1N1, but we can't really um, subtype it um, much further. And um, that it creates kind of a limitation in establishing a diagnosis of one of the avian influenza, such as H5N1. So we have our patient coming in testing positive for in, um, influenza A um, and this epidemiologic history and clinical presentation that raises concern for uh, possible um, avian influenza. Um, and then um, in terms of treatment, um, you know, we, we don't want to delay treatment, and I'll show some data as to um, in the improved outcomes with early treatment. So we want to start um, antivirals uh, promptly um, while we're waiting for some additional detailed information from laboratory testing. So now that we have an influenza diagnosis, uh, influenza A, we have um, a patient who's quite ill, we would start antiviral therapy with oseltamivir um, with a, an anticipated treatment course of at least five days, as well as um, supportive care um, to help the patient um, in their uh, in clinically responding. Uh, but uh, now that we've raised concerns about um, the possibility of influenza A, uh, particularly avian influenza, um, you know, I think the next step is to contact our um, our state public health laboratory. So here are the two um, individuals that would be uh, two of my primary resources. I'd reach out to Dr. Sosa, who's our Connecticut state epidemiologist, um, as well as Dr. Rizek, who is the uh, director of our state public health laboratory um, in Rocky Hill. Um, and the specimen would be sent from our clinical laboratory here at UConn to our um, state public health laboratory in Rocky Hill, um, where they would be able to perform additional testing um, to further uh, classify the subtype of um, influenza A that we're um, going to be evaluating. Um, 
our laboratory uses uh, this particular ABI multiplex uh, platform and a CTC protocol um, for subtyping that can identify specific subtypes, um, including H5 and H7, which are the predominant um, uh, avian influenzas that we would be concerned about in this particular situation. So in this case, um, the specimen does test positive for influenza A, H5, and 1. Um, and then uh, the next step would be to uh, notify colleagues at CDC um, and send the specimen down to CDC uh, for some additional testing, um, as well as um, the epidemiologic um, evaluation and uh, any outreach of um, potential contacts. So uh, just a brief word on treatment. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, early therapy does improve treatment outcomes. And this is a date, this is some data of um, sort of compiled uh, case uh, series and um, case reports on the impact of antiviral therapy on um, individuals with uh, H5N1 influenza A. Um, and, you know, across all the studies, we're really seeing that um, survival is um, strongly associated with um, the early initiation of um, antiviral therapy, specifically oseltamivir. So really, uh, we don't want to be delaying um, treatment while we're trying to get that additional laboratory um, testing results. Um, you know, once we identify that this is influenza A, we would start early antiviral therapy um, and provide supportive care in order to improve outcomes. So just to kind of finalize uh, the last part of this case, so this patient's treated with oseltamivir um, and subsequently improves. Um, the neighbor's bird, um, unfortunately, did not uh, recover as well and um, succumbed to illness. Um, and uh, the, e the EPA has very specific guidelines on how to dispose of an infected um, uh, bird. Um, and uh, the bird does subsequently test positive for influenza A, um, H5N1. And then the CDC works with our uh, public health laboratory to investigate uh, close human and avian contacts of the infected human and bird and found no other um, identified uh, cases. So uh, with that, I'll uh, complete that uh, summary of this case, and uh, we can uh, transition over to the Q&A. Terrific. Well, thanks. Um, we'll first do a virtual slash in-person round of applause for both of our speakers. So I'll just start with that. Excellent. And um, I'm going to encourage everyone. Oh, look at those clapping. I like that. Um, we'll be doing, um, I'll be moderating, and I'll start with uh, the first few questions. I'm going to put the first one to you. Um, Dr. Uecki from the Massachusetts State Epidemiologist, Dr. Katie Brown. She um, is asking about specifically the 2.3.4.4 B clade, which just rolled off your tongue very quickly when you were saying it. So I was practicing. Um, she says um, that there have been very few of those, or she wants to confirm that piece. Right. So of the 17 cases that have been reported since January of 2022, and one of those was reported in the UK that actually was uh, sampled at the end of December, 2021, but we include it because it's reported in January, early January of 2022. So 17 cases reported in eight countries. And as I mentioned, my personal feeling is seven of those that were asymptomatic plus the US case who reported only fatigue. I don't believe any of those represent true infection for many reasons. There's very, very low levels of viral RNA detected transiently, um, et cetera, et cetera. But um, anyways, if we talk about all the 17 cases, um, 13 of those were associated with exposure to um, clade 2.3.4.4 B viruses. There are four cases from Cambodia, two reported very early this year, and two reported in the last two weeks. Uh, three of those four were fatal. One was a mild case. The two most recent cases, and if you read some of the reports uh, publicly available, they're actually incorrect because they only say both, and they only say one of them was fatal, but both were fatal. One in a two-year-old child, one in a 54-year-old man. Um, the four Cambodia cases were associated with a different clade of virus, which we call clade 2.3.2.1c virus. And those viruses have been circulating in poultry in Cambodia and in the Mekong Delta since at least 2014. So it's sort of a, it's, it's a related, but it's a distinct antigenic group. 
that's just uh, in poultry in that area. And so, you know, to some extent that's important and to some other extent it's not. It's the point is that any of these highly pathogenic avian influenza AH5 and one viruses can actually transmit to people and kill people. Um, but the point is that these 2.3.4.4 B viruses have spread around most of the world in wild birds, particularly migratory birds, and then in seabirds, and then causing poultry outbreaks, spill over to mammals, and some very rare human infections. Those viruses simply have just outcompeted other H5N1 virus clades. So they're just predominant all over the world. And all of this is a moving target. So, you know, there were a few years ago when H5N1 viruses really, you know, were, were not being detected globally at a very, at much of a level. They were still present circulating in some poultry in some areas, not just Cambodia, but um, they, in fact, predominant viruses were other virus clades or other subtypes. There's another related subtype called H5N6 virus, which is a, also a highly pathogenic avian influenza virus. And that virus has transmitted and caused critical uh, and fatal human infections in China. And one, um, one human infection in Laos. So one of the points which I didn't make because this, this whole webinar is focused on H5N1 viruses, but there are many, many other avian influenza A viruses that actually have infected people, many different subtypes. And all of these different avian viruses have caused both uncomplicated illness, so very mild upper respiratory tract illness, as well as lower respiratory tract illness, including H5N1. It's not all severe disease. It's mainly, but some mild disease, as, as I think I mentioned. So we have really focused a lot of attention uh, on H5N1 virus worldwide, but we should not forget all these other avian influenza A viruses. And we have not talked at all about swine influenza A viruses. So wherever you go in the world and you sample pigs, you will detect swine influenza A viruses. And when there is spillover to infect people, generally those infections are relatively mild. But in terms of pandemic influenza A pandemic influenza preparedness, everyone's focus on H5N1 virus, and perhaps that's right, perhaps not. My perspective is we should not forget all these other avian viruses, including avian influenza A viruses that have not yet caused a, at least an identified human infection, but we should definitely not forget swine influenza A viruses. And if we go back to 2009, that influenza pandemic, the, the H1N1 pandemic, was caused by a virus that originated out of a swine reservoir, probably in southeastern Mexico. And at the time for pandemic preparedness, we were all focused on a highly pathogenic avian influenza a H5N1 virus that was causing human infections, particularly in Asia. But we were not focused on all these other viruses, including swine viruses. So my perspective is we should not just focus on H5N1 virus. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Yuaki. Um, so I think part of what I take from there is the importance of kind of uh, big picture, broad surveillance, keeping track of um, of uh, multiple types of uh, avian or swine flus. Let me turn to Dr. Bannock and ask you this question. So if someone presents to an emergency room, just like this patient, lots of patients coming in nowadays and over the next several months, they might test positive for flu A. Should we be asking everyone about bird exposure specifically? So, yeah, thanks for that question. I think, um, you know, whenever we're seeing patients coming in with acute respiratory illness, I think it's worth um, assessing um, for potential exposures. And that would include, um, 
you know, exposure to animals, um, both uh, domestic animals as well as wild animals um, and even poultry farming. Um, so I, I think, you know, in the, in the big picture, it's important to recognize that, um, you know, these uh, avian, avian infections tend to occur where birds congregate. So thinking about, um, you know, poultry farms and other like bird markets um, where the uh, avian to avian uh, transmission can occur. Th that would be kind of the higher risk settings, but, you know, certainly taking a history of whether a patient has a bird, uh, particularly if that bird is a recent acquisition or has been in contact with other birds, and if the bird has had recent illness, I think those would be uh, questions that would kind of guide the thinking as to uh, the likelihood of avian influence. I don't know, Dr. Yaki, if you have any additional thoughts on that. No, I agree with that. Um, and, and, you know, I think as both you and I have mentioned, um, there have been infections with a wide range of animal species. It's not just wild birds, it's not just poultry, but there are many wild mammals, both terrestrial as well as marine mammals that have been infected. And so I think particularly a history of exposure to a, uh, an animal, a bird, poultry, that has been sick or died. And, and, and particularly the contact, the exposure is really unprotected, close, exposure. I think if you're wearing, you know, respiratory protection, I think the exposure risk is, the infection risk is, is quite low. Excellent. I'll ask one follow-on question then, and then the second one related to that. So is right now in, um, for example, commercial poultry, is the expectation that the workers um, in those locations are wearing respiratory protection? So for the most part, they're protected. I see you nodding, Dr. Uecki, is that the case? Yes, um, USDA and CDC, we have recommendations for protection of poultry workers. And so I think that um, um, the issue is once the, I'll just give the example of a, a, a large die off of, of commercial sector poultry, you know, for responders going in there, definitely they should wear the same kind of respiratory and eye protection. Um, and PPE that we would recommend for healthcare personnel because they're going into a, a, an outbreak situation where um, the levels of virus are probably quite high in the dead birds, sick and dead birds, and in the environment. Um, however, one of the issues is before the outbreak is recognized or before responders come in, there may be people that are exposed who actually work in the facility um, who, who, who actually are not wearing any PPE. And that's actually a bigger concern um, of people who had unprotected exposures. And so similarly, when you're monitoring, it's local public health in collaboration with state public health in collaboration with us at CDC, um, monitoring worker exposures, which could not, could be more than just people exposed to poultry. It could be a veterinarians or other agricultural workers responding to dead animals. There have been die-offs of bald eagles from H5N1. There have been die-offs of California condors. So one has to think a bit broadly because of all the different animal species that have been actually infected and actually have died because of this virus is actually fairly widespread. And it's monitoring those people for at least seven days. I think you, you, seven day monitoring period, you capture the by and large the incubation period. I mean, there are a few outliers, but seven days will capture that. So I think it's identifying the people who have been exposed and then monitoring them for any kinds of symptoms. And if they are symptomatic, they need to be tested appropriately. Perfect. Um, so we've got two minutes left. I, I'll end with two questions. Um, one is, um, came in earlier from Dr. Jake Lazarus. Is it known how many mutations might be necessary to sustain human to human transmission? And there was a separate question came in really related to the status of any vaccines um, uh, to protect uh, against this right now when it's not really um, human to human, but perhaps also vaccines in animals. I'll try to answer that quickly. So the answer to the first question about mutations is, is unknown. What is known is people have looked at various mutations in H5N1 viruses in the ferret model and looked at ferret to ferret transmission. And the ferret is this sort of the established mammal model for influenza, including H5N1 viruses. And so transmission, particularly in the airborne um, um, model, um, would be a concern. 
And so the point I would make is that's important to inform public health, but what goes on in the ferret does not necessarily equal what might happen in a hum in humans, human to human transmission. And so I think animal models can be very helpful, but the point is we need surveillance in people. And particularly anytime there is a confirmed case, we need to monitor the close context of the case because of the question of identifying the source of exposure and the potential for human to human transmission and sampling those people adequately to be able to make sure that we look at characteristics of the virus. So it's both understanding the characteristics of the virus as well as the epidemiology. And then um, the well, I, other I think we're at the hour. Okay. Yeah, so I'm gonna, so first of all, just terrific, both of excellent talks. I do wanna let people know that we will have the recording. And then I noticed that in both of your slides, there are excellent links to resources and citations, um, which will um, hopefully inform the, the audience again. But this was terrific. Thank you so much for joining us today and for everyone here in, at MGH and online, lots of, Claps going up there if you can see them. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.